Grace and peace, everybody. Thanks for joining us online for church today. And today is our last Sunday where we're online only. We're so excited, man. Next Sunday, Father's Day, June 21st, we're going to be back at it in person, in the flesh, outdoors in the amphitheater at Westwind. So we want to see you, man. Bring all the people that you love. Bring most of the people that you hate. Just don't touch nobody. Come on over here. Bring your masks. Get yourself nice and hand sanitized. Give yourself a home baptism and some <laughs> alcohol solution, like the hand pumpy thing. Don't come to church drunk. The Lord will be very mad at you. But we'll be outside in the lawn, which is over here to my left, and we're going to have an absolutely fantastic time. 9 o'clock and 11 o'clock. Remember, we'll have designated seating uh, for each of your households, you know, so a whole household will be able to sit together so you don't have to be socially distanced from your kids or your, your husband or whatever, um, although you can be if you need a break. Um, and then and then we'll have lots of space in between each household so that there's no, you know, accidental touching or any of that good stuff. We'll have sand, hand sanitizer if you need some masks if you forget your own, and one bathroom. That's right. Please be sure to pee before you pray. Pee at home, pray with us, and that'll be next Sunday. We're so excited. Our breviary online services, those will still continue for some time. In fact, until the 4th of July, we'll still have our regularly uh, our regular 11 services each week, every Monday uh, through Friday morning and night, as well as the Kyrie service on Saturday. And then from the 4th of July through to Labor Day, our breviary schedule will change, and it'll be just in the mornings during the week, and then Wednesday nights we'll have a communion and prayer service each week. So that's the small change that we're making to the breviary. But for now, for this morning, we want to worship God with our giving. You can do that online at westwinds.org slash donate, and we encourage you to give and give generously and sacrificially as the Lord has enabled you. Amen? All right, let's keep singing.
we're so grateful for your presence in this place and in our lives. And we just want to lift your name higher than anything else this morning. We couldn't do it without you. We can't do it without you. And so thank you for walking beside us, before us, around us, and uh, carrying us and lifting us up, Father. We continually position ourselves to see you and to hear you. In Jesus' name. Oh, what can open our eyes when we're deep in the night? Only the light of your face. What can open our leaves amidst toil and tears? Only the sound of your voice. Only the sound. Exodus chapter 34, verse 29. When Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tablets of the testimony in his hand as he came down from the mountain, Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone because he had been talking with God. Aaron and all the people of Israel saw Moses, and behold, the skin of his face shone, and they were afraid to come near him. But Moses called to them, and Aaron and all the leaders of the congregation returned to him, and Moses talked with them. Afterward, all the people of Israel came near. And Moses commanded them that the Lord had spoken with him in Mount Sinai. And when Moses had finished speaking with them, he put a veil over his face. So whenever Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him, he would remove the veil. 
until he came out. And when he came out and told the people of Israel what was commanded, the people of Israel would see the face of Moses, that the skin of Moses' face was shining, and Moses would put the veil over his face again until he went in to speak with the Lord. This is one of the very few mentions in the Scripture about skin. There's stuff throughout the Bible here and there, but, but really, when the Bible talks about ethnicity, the Bible uses the word nations. And many times over the breviary in the last couple of weeks, we've examined some of the other ethnicities in Scripture, how we're supposed to treat people of different racial backgrounds, how we're supposed to treat people of different skin colors, and, and what the Bible believes about all people being made in God's image and likeness. But for the last couple of weeks, I thought, what about, like, what about skin? It just seems like there's more biblical material than we have maybe yet uncovered that speaks not only to the way we ought to interact as people of different racial and ethnic backgrounds, but, but plain old what it means to be humans, like what it means to be in flesh. Skin, after all, is a fantastically important part of who we are. The sense of touch is primarily mediated through skin. Actually, it's entirely mediated through skin. If you had no skin, you couldn't touch anything. There'd be nothing for anybody to touch. Skin is the casing that makes you, you. Skin and touch are the earliest sensations that we have. Before you can ever uh, taste anything, before you can ever hear anything, you, you can touch things and be touched. In fact, as young as six weeks in utero, a baby can respond to touch. That in, in, in little stimulus, stroking the fingers uh, along the different parts of the body, the baby will recoil, or sometimes the baby lean towards something that's, that's touching it. I mean, the touch is the first thing to wake up in us. And consider that, like, in something, a, a, a piece of skin the size of a quarter. I don't know if you can see that on the screen, but the, the size of a quarter. Um, th this has three million cells in it. And somewhere between 100 to 300 sweat glands, it's got 50 nerve endings in it and 30 feet of blood vessels. That's, like, that's significant. In, and you are constantly being regenerated. In fact, your body every four years gets entirely new skin. Your cells die off. New skin cells are, are replacing the old ones. I mean, we're just, our skin is so significant. It functions as our external nervous system. Everything that we happens outside of us happens to our skin. And so I thought, man, I wonder what the scripture has to say about skin. And I wonder what, what we might learn about being human, about being humane, and about being human together if we look at the biblical material on skin. So I thought, well, this, this piece of the Bible here about Moses is a great place to start because Moses skin shone, the skin of his face shone, which brings us really to our first point about skin, that skin is how we present ourselves to the world. In, in the case of Moses, you, people knew what Moses was like. People knew how Moses had been spending his time because of the way that he looked, because he was radiant, because the glory of God, the goodness of God, the presence of God was bursting out of his skin. And now that seems like an extreme example. It seems as though here Moses' face is actually shining, but maybe you know somebody who is radiant because they're in love. Or they're radiant and ecstatic because they've just had a newborn baby. Or, or they're radiant because they're, they're, they're uh, seeing somebody that they've missed for a long time. They're embracing and they're, they're just glowing and, and bursting with, with happiness, with joy, with enthusiasm, with love, with grace and peace. Our skin, the, the, the way we are, the, the, the way we present is, is how we show ourselves to the world. It's an exterior manifestation of who we are inside. That's why even things like uh, tattoos or, or piercings or even things like uh, makeup are all ways that we represent to everybody else, ways that we communicate to everybody else who, who we are in here. And if that's true positively, that's also true negatively. I mean, we have examples here of, of Moses and his face shining. Throughout the Psalms, we're told that the face of the righteous people shine forth with the glory of God. But, but then think about all the times that bad things happen to people's skin as manifestations of the evil and the darkness inside of them. Uh, Leviticus chapter 13, for example, goes into great detail about leprosy that is caused by sinful behavior. Le leprosy is a skin condition, like athletes, but for your whole body. It's something gross where your, your skin turns white and starts to flake off and get weird. And, and what the scripture is intending to communicate there is that sometimes the corruption inside of us will manifest on the outside of us. Um, and I think that that's worth considering. Like, w what are you and I 
doing inside and how is it presenting outside to everybody else? Because, again, skin is how we present ourselves to the world. Skin is also like our, our boundary, meaning skin is the end of where we are. Like, I don't, I don't exist outside of my own skin. I don't have a shadow self. There's not an invisible Dave McDonald astral projection that sort of shoots and wisps around. Ever. No, this skin is who I am. This is, this is where I end and where everything else begins. This is the end of me. This is my frontier. Um, and I think about Job chapter 2 where Satan is taunting God and Satan is taunting Job. And he says, Satan says to the Lord, skin for skin, all that a man has, he will give up in order to save his life. And, and here the scripture is representing truth, that truth that's being twisted by the devil in order to be manipulative. But what, what, what the Bible essentially is saying is, yeah, like this is, this is the end of me. And as much as my heart feels like it's tethered and connected to my family, me, it stops right here. This, it, it organizes what things are mine and, and what things are not mine. It's a barrier between me a, and the world. That's why our skin d does all kinds of things. That, you know, it regulates body temperature. It regulates b blood pressure. It, we have sweat glands that help. We have uh, two-way gas exchange through our skin. All, all this kind of stuff just makes sure that my skin kn knows where I begin and where I end. And I was reading a book this week called The Power of Touch because, of course, we haven't been allowed to touch very much. Uh, we, we don't hug as often as we used to. We don't shake hands as often as we used to. People are even reluctant to give a friendly elbow bump or a, a fist bump or anything like that. And so it just occurs to me that, that when we start coming back together physically, when we start being able to be in the same spaces, one of the things that we're going to find awkward is, is touching. Like, how can we touch? Should we touch? Should we not touch? Um, we're going to have to learn all over again the meaning of consent because where that used to be an issue primarily between, you know, lovers, now the issue of consent is an issue for all of society. Am I allowed to shake your hand? I should probably ask. I mean, just touching is so peculiar and so scarce, and, and we miss it. We're starving without it. We feel lonely and isolated and cut off because because the boundary that separates me from you is now so sharply defined. I mean, it's always been there, but now, now it's like there's a fence, an invisible fence around me and around you. And, and I, just, I just think it's worth acknowledging that that boundary needs to be pressed, needs to be touched, needs to be explored. And in, in this book that I was reading, The Physical Power of Touch, the, the researcher, Ashley Montague, is talking about the fact that, that newborn animals have to be licked. You ever see like a, a mama cat with her kittens? And, and you see the mama cat licking the kittens. You see this, of course, with puppies. You see it with, with all animals in the animal kingdom, especially mammals. But the purpose of that licking is not cleaning. Scientifically, the purpose of that licking is to wake up the newborn to the fact that it's alive and it has borders and boundaries. The, the purpose is awareness. A and if animals are not licked by their mothers, they die. In fact, some species, like sheep, they don't even learn how to stand. G giraffes, camels, some species of donkey, th they don't know where they are or even who they are yet. They don't know where they begin or end. They still have a memory of what it was like to be inside of their mother, and they have no awareness of what's theirs. F for you and I, it is critical to understand what is ours, and it is critical to understand that what is ours is our responsibility, but we still need contact beyond our boundaries in order to be healthy, fully functioning human beings. Number three, skin throughout the scripture and in life provides protection, protection from germs, protection from sharp and broad injury, uh, protection. Uh, we absorb medicine through our skin topically. We secrete waste through our skin, through sweat and all kinds of stuff. It, skin acts as a self cleanser. Um, and I think about the scripture in Micah where God is blasting the enemies of Israel. Micah chapter 3, he says, there are those among you who hate what is good and love what is evil. There are those among you who tear the skin, pardon me, tear the skin from off of my people and tear their flesh from off of their, uh, off of their bones. There are those among you who eat the flesh of my people and flay their skin from off of them and break their bones in pieces and chop them up like meat in a pot, like skin in a cauldron. Woe to you, says the Lord. I mean, clearly God is saying here, one of the most evil things you could do is remove the skin from someone. Because skin protects us. 
And I think right now in a time of such racial disunity, such a time of, of r- remarkable tension, one of the things that we have to be really careful to do is not take the skin off of people. We can't pretend that everybody looks the same, that everybody has the same background, that everybody has the same culture. We, we can't pretend that we're all just basically the same. We're, we're just sort of, you know, d- different flavors. That, that's far too simplistic. Our skin, our identity, our boundaries, the things that are ours and theirs and theirs and theirs, that, that defines us and that definition protects us. It gives us a place to heal It gives us a community. It gives us a heritage. It gives us an identity. We should embrace those things, not only for ourselves, but we should embrace and celebrate those in others, too. I think also of the scripture in Ezekiel, chapter 37, in the vision of the valley of dry bones. When God is putting the bones back together again, one critical ingredient of of things going backwards from being a skeleton to being a human is skin. It's the second to last step in the re humanification of those that have died. The only thing after the skin is the spirit, the breath, the very breath of God. But the skin, that's what makes, that's what makes a person a person instead of a corpse, instead of a cadaver. Skin is alive, and it serves as a living barrier to keep what is ours healthy, functioning, and aware. And last but not least, the fourth biblical purpose of the skin is communication. Skin is how we talk to each other in, a, in some normal ways, you know, we, with the power of touch, with nods and waves and gestures and, you know, j- gentle touching. But, but think even in Acts chapter 19, there's a strange episode where the apostle Paul has a handkerchief. And God's, this is chapter 19, verse 11. God was doing extraordinary miracles through the hands of the Apostle Paul so that even handkerchiefs or aprons that had touched his skin were carried away to the sick and their diseases left them and the evil spirits came out of them. Something powerful is contained in our touch. And that touch from our skin to even an inanimate object like a handkerchief or an apron somehow communicates the things that we put into it when we touched it. And in fact, this is a really important piece of the Bible to me because many of you have been praying for me and standing in the gap for me and for my father who's, who is dueling with pancreatic cancer right now. And a little over a year ago, he was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer and he was supposed to go to a large council and assembly of pastors. There were about a thousand people in attendance and he, he was supposed to be one of them, but because of his diagnosis, he couldn't travel. So the leader of that gathering... Bishop Doug Beecham went and bought a handkerchief. And then he prayed for that handkerchief in a service with all those people gathered. And then he passed that handkerchief around and person and person and person grabbed hold of it and prayed for it. And then they mailed it to my father. And now, a year and, well, I don't know, many months later, every single day, my father takes that handkerchief out of his Ziploc bag and he places it on his chest, and my mom puts her hands over top of his hands, and they pray and trust God for healing in his physical body. And when I'm with my dad, my hand is on that handkerchief, my mom's, my nephews, my nieces, my children, everybody prays for him like that because there's something powerful that's transmitted through our skin. And through our touch, even if it's through a mediator, like a handkerchief. Because clearly there's nothing powerful about it. It's just cotton. The power, the love, the meaning is transmitted from us. So if this is what our skin is, and this is what our skin does, it's, it's clearly important. So is it any wonder why our skin divides us? I mean, just think about the ways that we talk that are so skinly, so so touch sensitive. Like we rub people the wrong way. We can be abrasive. We can be prickly. We're hard to deal with. We have to be handled. We can be touchy. We can be thin skinned. We can be soft. We can get out of touch. We can lose our grip. We can cling to fragile solutions. I mean, 
the way we touch, the, the things that we are, our, our skin is so deeply hardwired into our subconscious, so, so deeply woven into to the consciousness of our culture, we're ignorant to it. We're, we're blind to it. We, we miss it all the time. And by looking at the biblical material on skin, I keep asking myself these questions over and over and over again. Like, number one, I ask myself, what do people see when they see my skin? Now, I'm aware that sometimes I can be a little intimidating. I, I'm aware that sometimes if I'm walking around and I have sunglasses on or a flat-billed hat or something, that people go, oh, man, there is an angry, angry white guy with, with big tattoos, and it, it always cracks me up when somebody, like, hides their children from me, you know. That doesn't usually happen when I get a chance to talk to them. Because usually once I start talking, the things inside of me open up. And that's what I want. I want to be open-faced. I want to shine like Moses, Sean. And before I even get to ever get to Moses, I think the, the shiniest person I've ever met, the, the most significant beacon of gladness in my life was an African-American lady at Westwinds for years and years and years named Doris Wilson. Many of you might remember her. But Doris Wilson could light up a room, never mind with her smile, just with her eyes. She, she was a beautiful and luminous spirit. And so I think that's how I want to. I want to be like Doris. I want to be like Doris, who herself was like Moses. Maybe Doris was, was like Paul, who was like Jesus, who was like Moses. I mean, but I just think that that's how I want to be. I want the truth and the beauty of my spirit to burst out of my face. Because I think that's what my skin is for. So what do people see when they see you? What do people see when they see your skin? You shine. Another question that I ask myself is whether or not I'm clear about what's mine. I mean, if my skin is my boundary, there's certain things that are, that are my responsibility, they're under my purview, that are under my control, and there are certain things that I can't do anything about. So I got to get really crystal clear on where I end and somebody else begins. I got to get really crystal clear on where my responsibilities, my ability to control things end and where somebody else's things begin because all the time somebody's trying to pull me into something or push me into something. And if I'm not careful, I, I'm going to get pushed and pulled into places that I don't belong. The same is true for you. But I'm not going to tell you where you do or don't belong or what you should be involved in or shouldn't be involved in. That's for you to figure out. That's for us to figure out individually and together. But we've got to figure out what, what's ours, what's theirs, and what's ours together. Third question that I ask myself, and I'd like you to ask yourself today too, is, is whether or not we're taking appropriate care of ourselves. Like are we smart about our protection? I mean, think about this in terms of your skin, because you you got to be smart sometimes. I remember when I was, I've, I've been to Haiti several times, but the first time I went to Haiti, I was 16, uh, a little white Canadian kid, and Haiti, predominantly a, a, a dark-skinned uh, country, and there's real racial hostility, and in particular, I think Haitians might be the only people that hate Canadians. I don't know why, but, you know, no, 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 the people from Belize also hate Canadians. Everybody else love us, hate the geese, but Haitians and people from Belize, th they don't like Canadians at all. So I remember this little, little white Canadian kid, 16, going, we're going to a place in Haiti called the Iron Market. It's really a famous place, a big tourist destination, but it's, it's spooky. It's scary. And they told us, hey, you got to be really careful when you're here because these people don't like you. And when they see your skin, they're going to be looking for ways to take advantage of you or possibly to hurt you. And sure enough, man, we, there's story after story after story after story of everybody from police officers, missionaries, healthcare workers. Uh, w when they get in the iron market, they get targeted. Now, that doesn't mean you shouldn't go there. That just means you got to be smart. You got to protect yourself. You got to be clever. You got to be clear. And that's the same for anybody of any ethnicity. That's the same for anybody of any background. Y you've got to be smart about what you're doing and not being careless because there's too many stories about people who think those things don't matter to other people because they don't matter to us and they get themselves in real trouble. You know, you, you got to be smart and you got to be wise and you got to be loving and you got to be serving. You got to be a lot of things. You go, Dave, I don't know that I can keep it all straight. That's okay. That's okay. You've got God's Holy Spirit in you to guide you and help you navigate these tricky troublesome waters so don't try and do it on your own you breathe deeply of the holy spirit and move forwards and then last but not least i, I want to know for me what am i communicating with my touches like 
Like when I get close to people, do they feel blessed? Do they feel loved? Do they feel healed? Do they feel graced? Do they feel encouraged? Or do they feel harmed or hurt or alienated or abused? See, when I look at these stories, you know, the, the story of Moses' face shining, the, the, the story of Satan taunting Job and taunting God, the, the, the story of, of God's fury against those who love evil in Micah, the story of God's protection and resurrection in Ezekiel. When, when I look at, at the stories of the Apostle Paul and his heal, healing touch, what this presents for me is a huge theology of the skin, which is to say what? I mean, it's, it's telling me how to be a human being. It's telling me how to be a person made in God's image and likeness. And if all of these things are true for me, then they're true for my skin, then they're true for you too. And they're not only true for you and me, they're true for the whole planet, they're true for the whole country. We ought to be people who advocate skin care. We ought to be looking after each other, ensuring that all people get the privilege and the opportunity to flourish in God's good creation and God's good and well-ordered world. And friends, man, we got some work to do. So it's time for you and me to get in touch. We got to cultivate the personal touch. The magic touch. We've got to find good ways to reach out and touch somebody for the love of the Lord and the good of the world. Grace and peace, everybody. I'll pray for you, and may Jesus bless you richly. Lord, thank you for the privilege of being made in your image, regardless of whether we're black or white or any ethnicity or any background. We, together as your people, thank you that you've made us like you. You've given us your spirit. And we commit together, Lord, we're going to do better. We're going to move forward in Jesus' name. Amen.